starting the recording here. Um, so I'm just going to make sure my computer... I think I can, I can talk and do this at the same time. Anyway, um, my name's Natalie. I'm the Vice Chair of uh, the Haldane Society of Socialist Lawyers. Um, can people raise their hand if this is the first time they've gone to a Haldane Society lecture? Okay, so we have a few new people. I imagine um, most of you are students either here or activists. Anyway, just a bit about the Haldane Society. So we're a group of mostly lawyers, as the name suggests. We're all socialists. Some of us are activists, and uh, we also have trade unionists and academics. So some of the things that we do, uh, we put out a publication about three or four times a year called Socialist Lawyer, where we have fantastic articles from people all around the world about legal issues um, through, through a socialist left-wing uh, lens. We look at, we campaign for the law to change, and we also look at the way that uh, law can be uh, oppressive towards women, uh, minorities, um, have uh, class ramifications as well. So essentially, we both campaign towards the law, and we're critical of the law in itself. Uh, so some of the other things that we do, we do legal observing. So that's something which Catherine up in the front row does, and this is something that all of you could get involved in if you're interested, particularly as the spring and summer months are, are coming up. What we do is we attend as independent legal observers on uh, protests, and we monitor the police to make sure that people's right to protest is being respected. So we would, uh, we would train you in relation to that, and I think it's a great way um, to, to make practical use of, of your legal training if you do have a legal background. In addition, and um, through actually how this lecture was set up, we have started the Haldane Feminist Lawyers. It's been running for about three years now. This talk specifically came out of our fantastic conference that a lot of people in this room worked on, and um, that was Women Fighting Back international and legal perspectives and there are a number of speakers in this room who are there as well and um, this was one of our workshops about political prisoners and we very much wanted to get um, take forward the themes from that conference and to give it a bigger stage really so it's great for you guys all to be here and, and to, to, to see it today some other things that are coming up on Monday we're going to be showing Persopolis uh, for free and to talk about it that's through the Haldane Feminist Lures at uh, the London Action Resource Center near Whitechapel, so not too far from here. You are all welcome. We're also going to read, I think it's going to be Angela Davis's Our Prisons Obsolete and have a discussion group around it. So if you're interested in any of the things which I've just said, um, either come talk to myself or talk to Catherine. Um, just a bit about our speakers, as you can see, oh, no, it's not up there anymore. It's Free Her Women Political Prisoners. We have um, Dr. Rada D'Souza, who hopefully is coming very soon, but I thought we'd make a start uh, with Shiva Mavubi. Did I say that right? Yes. Great. Um, so Rada is a barrister uh, in the High Court of Bombay, and she's uh, a lecturer at the University of Auckland and Waikato in New Zealand, and she also um, teaches at University of Westminster. She's also a freelance writer and a social justice activist, and Shiva here is a former political prisoner in Iran, and she's now uh, an organizer for the campaign on political prisoners in Iran. I think it's called the CFPII. PPI. 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 <laughs> I, I might be reading the old version from the website. Anyway, so I think the, the, the best way to deal with this is, is maybe to have uh, Shiva you speak for 20 minutes, okay. rather for 20 minutes, and then we'll take questions. We have to be at our 8.30, but we can finish our discussion in the pub. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to... Do you want me to sit there? Yes, and then I'll... Hello, everyone. I'm oh, sorry, I'm not usually late, but it was really difficult to find here. <laughs> so... Uh, I think I have 20 minutes, so very nice meeting you all. Thank you for being here, and thank you so much to Holland Society. I think this is very important, and thanks to the organizer that they organize this topic, which usually they don't talk about it in different places. Uh, since I have 20 minutes, I'll try my best to just squeeze some points in that 20 minutes, and then we have question and answer, and follow I'm going to the park, and so on. Okay. Uh, Basically, I always say that you cannot talk about the situation of uh, female political prisoners um, unless you talk about the situation of women in Iran. And you can't so talk about the situation of women in Iran um, until you talk about the laws of power, the misogynist laws that actually suppresses women. 
So I'll just give you a bit of background, and in my talk, I'll just give you a few points on the situation of women in Iran after the revolution, and that picture that you see that actually the first demonstration against the hijab, the Islamic dress code. The law against women, I will mention some of the laws as it is. Uh, the fight against the misogynist laws, female political prisoners in 80s, in 90s, and now, because there was a different reason they were arrested. And also the extra pressure on female political prisoners, as they call it, gender-specific torture. Again, in 80s, 90s, and now, is very different. Not very, but slightly. But also what's happening now, actually. So, uh, as you see, that was a demonstration, and two pictures after that, actually. It was 8th of March, 1979, 47 years ago. Sorry, I'm just going to put my image here, sorry. Okay. So, uh, 40, 37 years ago, that when the revolution got hijacked by the Islamic regime, and the first thing they did, the attack on people, it was attack on women, basically. They, had, they started announcing that women need to wear hijab, uh, they cannot come out of the house unless they cover themselves. So when they said that, of course, it was a shock because all these women were participating in 1979 revolution quite visibly. And they didn't say yes or we will obey. That's what happened. And if you can have the next two pictures also, you can see that millions of women came on the streets of Tehran and some other cities shouting that very famous one, the slogan was saying that, we've had the revolution, revolution to go forward, not to go backward. And from then on, what they did that, of course, um, hasn't finished with just that. After they announced the revolution, they made it a law, and they started uh, suppressing women, started arresting them. Let's say, for example, if they had nail polish on, they would put their fingers inside a bag full of insects and cockroaches, or they would use any sort of the most brutal way to actually uh, force them to obey the Islamic dress code. They, sometimes they wouldn't allow them to come inside the shops because they're mobs. I better call them the mobs of the Islamic regime. They were there and they would push them back. So they actually got the law after that and said that uh, according to Article 102 of the regime constitution, and this is a real law, this is not a fiction, Women who appears on the street and in public without the prescribed Islamic hijab will be condemned to 74 strokes of lash. And this is happening now. It's a law of the country right now as well. And of course, as you can see, all these women, you don't expect them to just say, okay, we'll do it. What happened, every street and alleyways literally has become the battleground between fighting, basically between the guards and women. And hijab becomes a symbolic thing for both sides. So as they went on, some the arrest over hijab, because it was a symbolic thing, they literally wanted to um, control more than half of the population by forcing them to wear hijab. And this is going on because if I look, in, look at the statistic, in 2013, and this is official statistic, around 2,917,000 women were warned by the Islamic guard for their failure to observe the Islamic dress code. In the same year, more than 207,53 women were forced to sign a written statement saying that we're not going to commit crime anymore, meaning that we're going to put our scarf on. And so from then on, during the 37 years, without exaggeration, millions of women were arrested only because they didn't want to obey the Islamic dress code. And as we went on, of course, it didn't stop there. They started attacking different aspects of women's life in terms of education, if I can use some of them, sport, education, divorce, having the custody of the ch children, inheritance, how you present yourself in public places, and all that. And that wasn't just some people practicing this in Iran. It was actually became law. I'll just give you an example of some of the laws, which ironically is called civil code, which is nothing civil about it actually. So when, when they brought laws to legalize the violence against women, like some of, the, some of them are Article 18 of passport law, it's literally saying that married women needs to require, they require permission <coughs> from the husband to get passport or get out of the country. And adding to that, in 2013, 
they said that even women who are not married, they need the permission of the male of the family to be able to get the passport or travel around. Article 1105 says that the relations between husband and wife, the position of the head of the family in the relation between husband and wife, the position of the head of the family is the exclusive right of the husband. Again, Article 11, verse 7 says the husband can prevent his wife from uh, occupation or technical work which is incompatible with the family interest or the dignity of his, himself or his wife. Article 1133 says a man can divorce his wife whenever he wishes to do so. So these are the laws of the country and it's been practiced over 37 years. They went further, the situation hasn't gone better. They went further. In 2013, they passed a bill in the parliament allowing men to marry his adopted daughter while she is only 13 years old. And this is a law right now, they can do that. In 2014, they went further, they brought a bill, which is called for Bill 407, which the title is Bill to Increase Fertility Rate and Prevent Population Decline, which telling people you have to have more babies, but looking at all these laws against women, it's literally reduced women to baby making machine and they passed that law as well and uh, so these are just really a few example of the laws that you know power and of course one law has different sort of uh, what they call it different section that they practice it in different way in university so it applies to different parts of the society so but you're looking at all this law, and you can imagine, how can someone live in that situation for 37 years? How is possible, actually? Because whatever you do, whatever you wear, wherever you go, whatever you want to study, you want to marry, any, every single thing, there is a law defined for that that doesn't allow, to, to allow you to do that. So, but the amazing thing about Iran, as again, referring to that picture, I think from that day that they came on the street, they felt like, like their dreams going to be tarnished. That's it. We have to fight back. And I think from that day, fighting became a, a most prominent part of women's life. And even second generation continued as well. They didn't have a choice, basically. But despite all this, the punishment, imprisonment, when they arrested lots of women, they actually raped them, kidnapped them. <coughs> They imprison them, they execute them, or they shoot them on the street, different occasions, especially when they try to control them. Well, women who had really important role in 1979, this woman in 2009, how many of you know about 2009 uprising in Iran? You know, those millions of people came on the street. By the way, they don't call it green movement, it's people's movement. <laughs> That's the wrong term to use. Uh, but what I'm saying, in the 2009, again, there are lots of women, and one of the pictures, if you can please go ahead, it was Neda Agha Sultan. It was the woman, if you remember, uh, she actually was shot on the street, and her face was all over the media. And uh, on that day also, 2009, lots of women participated in demonstrations, organizing actively, not just, let's say, people come and ask them to come out, they were actively organizing. So all that were happening, and of course when you do that, when you fight back, the punishment is prison, torture, the most brutal way of treating you and keeping you in the most inhuman condition in prison. I'm not saying prison has human condition, but that specific situation is very different. So they attacked women, they attacked activists, even if you would talk about women's rights or anything criticizing your laws, and you were a journalist, you're supposed to talk about it, you would be arrested. But then you imagine lots of women ended up in prison. But in 80s, female political prisoners, I would say most of people were, the specification of 80s was most of them were organizing political parties, mainly leftist parties. So most of these political parties, they had actually their own section of women's rights committee, etc. So women were organizing them because I think women knew that from that day, until this regime is in power, it's just impossible to get rid of it. So therefore, we have to get rid of it. And the only way to do, to do that 
to get organized. So most of women were organizing parties and um, in political parties, and the age range in prison was for 12, 12 years old to 70 years old. I have to mention that after the 79 uh, revolution, just to give you a background, uh, regime wanted to find a bit of a stability because they had to. So they used execution, killing, and all this, but they had to do it in a massacre way to scare people. And at the time, remember, there were no internet, there were no Twitter or Facebook, nothing like that. So they were impossible to send news outside. So in 1981, they had a crackdown on all the political on all the political parties, and they arrested everyone who actually looked like a political person, never mind being active. So supporter, member of them, and all that. Hello. And uh, so uh, as it went on. They got all these millions of people in prison, and now what are we going to do with them? We have killed some of them, we've arrested, and now they ended up with thousands of political prisoners, lots of women in prison that they were still fighting inside the prison. They were organizing, actually, amazingly. So what they did, they felt that they had to get rid of a uh, re generation of revolutionaries, basically. So in the summer of 1988, and if you're more interested, you can, you can email me, I'll send you a link uh, from a very good report done by, I think, Jeffrey Robertson on that. And um, in summer of 1988, during three weeks, they executed more than 5,000 people, more than 5,000 people. Most of them are women who were in prison cell. They were forced to get away from their children and, <coughs> and then executed. We had people that they had six members of their family being executed. So I'm um, just trying to fast forward. <laughs> so in, but in 90s, after this, remember, there was a massacre like Chile, if you remember, in Brazil, all these countries, they had dictatorship. They get rid of a generation of revolutionaries. So uh, when that happened in 90s, or almost in the 90s, if you look at it, the female political prisoner and men, all of them, they were more civil front activists. They were more not necessarily being organized in political parties, but mostly organizing demonstration, defending children's rights, and all that, which it's not a normal thing to do, that you, get, you still get arrested for that. So in terms of the um, torture, of course, they would torture everyone, but for women, they always had and still have the gender-specific torture, as, as they call it. In 80s, it was different. In 80s, if you if you remember, I told you, they arrested lots of people, even if they looked like activists or whatever. They arrested them on the street. Most of these women, they were with their kids. So they wouldn't allow them to call their house to, so their family, they pick up their kids. They would take them with the kids. Or, for example, if they would go home and arrest them, they would ask them, can you bring your kid with you? Whatever, could be newborn baby, could be a few years. So these children were kept in prison, in cell, and in many cases we have these witness accounts that they talk about how they've been raped and tortured, and their kids actually in the corner of the cell. And the amount of psychological pressure on the kid and themselves, you can just, I think you can't even imagine it, to be honest, it's so brutal. And also the other thing, sexual harassment, which is quite common even now, but at the time, the other thing they did they used to uh, not rape every woman. They used to rape mostly women who were getting executed. And their excuse was that uh, virgin go to heaven. This is the stupid Islamic law. So in order to, for you not to go to heaven, because you're an infidel, we rape you and then we execute you. And in many cases, they would have a like sweet taken to the family. And Majid said, well, we executed your daughter, by the way, she got married to me before. And the amount of pain in that mom's, which actually it was one of my very best friend's mom that happened to her as well. And also pregnant women. I mean, pregnancy could have been used against you, of course. If you're pregnant, don't think that as a woman you would be more protected. No, actually, if they knew you were pregnant, they would use it against you either by kicking or torturing you. Some of the women actually, they missed their babies because they couldn't. Some of those, as we call it, lucky, if they had their baby being born in prison, I don't know how lucky is that, to be honest. 
the, so one of them was saying that how uh, she didn't have anything to eat, so as a result, she couldn't give milk to the baby. And it was nothing, as she could see this newborn baby actually suffering of hunger. And as it, these are mainly, I mean, still is going on, but because of the internet and all these sending news out, they can't do as much as that. In 80s, one of the things they used, they didn't use it anymore. What they did, they forced women, they tortured them and forced them on, to either do written or televised uh, false confession, saying that we had sexual relationship with our male colleagues. And they had to do it on the television, so their family, everyone would hear about it. This was one of the things, and they would force them to actually talk about detail that didn't e exist anyway. Uh, in 2009, the same uprising that you said uh, you remember, it was a bit different. And uh, okay, let me go back to that. in 90s. Also, the other thing uh, in 80s, the other thing would do, which they don't do it now, they would force the prisoners to marry the interrogator. Imagine marrying your own perpetrator. And uh, what happened? They would torture them, and they would tell them, if you don't marry me, of course they would do lots of sexual harassment, assault, everything like that. If you don't marry me, I'm going to arrest your family, I'm going to kill them, and I'll kill them in front of you. Some of them, they got married, and actually one of them has written a book about it. Because what would you do actually if they put you there, and you know they're capable of doing that? You have to choose. And in uh, 2009, the uprising that you said you remember, and uh, in 2009, uh, one thing that was very significant among men and women, it was rape. We have never had that many rape in prison. In 2009, uh, there were actually men, women, whoever, in different way, they were raping them. And in fact, I work, because I work as a counselor, as a therapist as well, I work with survivor of this torture, that they were only three days in prison, but yet this amount of suffering and trauma they have, they still, after a few years, they can't process it. Uh, one of the accounts, I know, I'm sorry, I don't mean to really, I know it's so brutal even saying that, but I think sometimes we need to hear it. There are lots of accounts and uh, eyewitnesses, but one of them was saying that uh, there is a picture in there that is the woman, uh, if you go, if you go ahead, this is again from the, if you just keep going, sorry, oh, this one. This is, do you remember this picture? I'm sorry that it's very bloody, and the, the previous one. This is Nada Aga Sultan, who was killed in the 20, 2009 uprising. This woman referring to Nada, it's saying that this is a woman who survived. It says, when Nada, that woman, died on the street, all of Iran and the rest of the world knew. But when they were raping and torturing me and putting out cigarettes on my body, nobody knew. The first thing he did was lick my face with his tongue. Then he started touching my bra and all over my body. I was crying. Please, please don't. I'm innocent. I'm a virgin. He said, no, you're not a virgin anymore. Then he raped me. After he raped me, he urinated on me, on my whole body. Multiply this by thousands, and this is what happened to them. Yes, lots of trauma, but what's happening now? Okay, I'm sure you follow the news. I'm sure you hear about Rouhani making nuclear deal and all this stuff. Has the situation gotten better? No, not at all. I mean, it's kind of difficult and in fact impossible <coughs> to have any, any significant change in Iran in the situation of women and generally or to release political prisoners when the law of the country suppresses slightest voice of opposition. It's just impossible. I mean, in the last 37 years, millions of people were arrested, thousands were executed. So you can imagine with that scale, how can you actually, how can you actually uh, expect any changes? In one year under Rouhani's presidency, everyone knows Rouhani, right? Yeah, thanks to the media propagandizing for Rouhani so much as well. So uh, under Rouhani's presidency, Basically, only in one year, more than 1,000 prisoners were executed. Do you hear about that? Not at all. There are still hundreds of 
political prisoner, thousands actually, and many of them are women who right now, as I'm speaking with you, uh, they are in the prison cell with their children. Do you see that on media? Do you read it anywhere? Not really, you don't. I mean, the problem is like, especially after the nuclear deal, the way they portrayed it, everywhere literally, as if Rouhani came and brought change to Iran. And this is really dangerous, because you can imagine, it can easily divert attention of what's going on exactly in Iran. I mean, lots of those people, if you can just keep going, sorry about that. And if you can, these are women's rights activists, children's rights activists, uh, photographer, this is an artist that could draw that, and because of that, God, I will tell you how many years it says that, got in prison. And one of the things they actually used against him, when she met with her lawyer, she, sh she shook hand. And to them, this is actually illegal. How dare you? You're a woman, you're shaking with men. They wanted to retrial her again because of that. You have a relationship with this lawyer. Bear in mind, barely, I mean, not so much, so often prisoners can have meetings with the lawyer. They don't even know each other. So lawyers is just a name that they have there, but they don't use it. So if you see all these women, this is just a few of them that have been arrested for different reasons. This is Baha'i, got 20 years in prison. <coughs> and as you go on, human rights activist, women's rights <coughs> activist, supporter of human rights, supporter of human rights, nothing else. So all these people, just a few faces, so you know these are real people there. And But I would like to finish, I know my time is up, I would like to finish with, uh, really leave me with a few questions, which I, which I think is quite normal. I'm sure you care about human rights, that's why you're here. I think the big question is that, what are we going to do? This is what's going on. And I would like to ask you, and your organization, to ask yourself that, okay, how can I be the voice of these political prisoners? How can I echo, even if they have voice, how can I echo their voice? How can I be the voice of those little kids that actually they were born in prison and they see suffering all this trauma? How can I, my, how can my organization do that? And at the same time, I think every one of us, as an organization, an individual, we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to help building an international solidarity to force the Iranian regime to release all these political prisoners? Or if I, if I talk about it in a scale of internationally, how are we going to build an international solidarity to force the governments in different countries, I'm sure Radha will talk about, for example, India uh, or many other countries, how are we going to force them to release all these political prisoners? Why can't we do that? I think this is an expectation, and I would like you, when you get out of that room, just take this with you, think about it, that how can you help? And I'm sure every one of you can help me. So ask that question from anyone. What do they do? This is a humanity, and we believe humanity has no border. So thank you so much, and um, that's it, I guess. <laughs>
Okay. So anyway, she came and got me, Amy. She almost lost her way. <laughs> but I'm here now, and that's the most important thing. Um, India is just the opposite of Iran in most people's minds. And I say minds because in Britain, in most people's mind, India is a democracy. It's the world's most populous democracy. It has regular elections. It has a fantastic constitution. So we can't, unlike Iran, we can't complain that the constitution doesn't give rights. And at every level of British society, there are links between people at very working class level, at House of Lords level, at you know political level, business level, at every level, there are links between India and, and, and Britain. And we have a shared history that goes back a long way. So India is in some ways a very different ballgame from say Iran. And in Iran's case, we mentally we are prepared to accept terrible things. But in India's case, civil liberties activists have a problem straight away because the mindset is closed. This can't be right. I go to India, so this can't be right. And the newspapers are in English. There are English TV channels. Anyone can read them. Yeah, But that's, uh, that's the kind of uh, uh, thing. And so I want to now start with, this is a picture from the Lakshmi Bai Regiment, which was during the Freedom Struggle. But I want to leave the freedom struggle out because let's let's take it. Let's be generous and say that's over, finished, and that's gone. Except to say that the category of political prisoners is a colonial category. You don't have political prisoners in the United States or France or Britain or anywhere else. This is a category of prisoners that was introduced by colonial regimes. So, and therefore, the question straight away becomes, you know, why are we having political prisoners in the world's largest democracy, if you like? What I want to do now is to just sort of uh, set out a few cases, prominent cases, and then go into some sort of, uh, give you a little bit of a commentary and background to this. Um, Now, the first problem, political prisoners are, by definition, are about state violence. It's not cultural <coughs> violence, it's not patriarchy, it's not family violence. All of those things we can, we can, you know, well, we know what it is, we don't approve of it, but one can understand the culture is longer and more resilient, whatever. And the important thing is that here, you hear about women's issues in terms of patriarchal societies, you know, um, discrimination and all of those things, but you never hear about political violence against women, state violence against women. One of the most central issues about uh, uh, violence against women has been the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. And this, this is why I said, let's leave. We got independence in 1947, and the Armed Forces Special Powers Act came into existence in 1942, <coughs> five years later. And since then, in many parts of India are occupied by the army. And you may not, I don't know to what extent you are aware of this, but in the Northeast, for example, Kashmir, for example, and the Special Powers Act gives immunity to the armed forces. You can't prosecute them, you can't bring them to court, you can't do anything. You know, you, there are no legal processes because they have absolute immunity. And one of the uh, demands of the 
uh, women from some of these states has been we want to get rid of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act because they brutalize women. And so, but there is another thing that I want to point out. I started off by saying I want to leave colonialism behind. Yeah. But you can see that it's not an easy thing to do because everything goes back to, you know, has a history. So if you look at the other main source of state violence is the anti-terrorism laws. And the anti-terrorism laws, the first anti-terrorism law in the British Empire was in India in 1914. So it was trialed there before it came to the rest of the world. And since independence, we have never had a period without uh, anti-terrorism laws. I'm not speaking about uh, you know, extremism now or terrorism after 9-11 or something. I'm talking about since 1952, 1914, 1938, 19, you know, and then after independence, we had straight away uh, the uh, TARA, which was the UAPA, the, um, uh, un uh, the Unlawful Practices Act, and we had uh, TADA, the Terrorism and uh, Disruptive Activities Act. Then we had POTA, then we had UAPA 2004, UAPA 2008. And each one of these statutes gives the armed forces a free hand. And in any society, when the armed forces get a free hand, they, take, they use their freedom. Why wouldn't they? If you remember especially, that the purpose of deploying armed forces is to control the population. That is why an army is sent to a place. And if the purpose is to control the population, the armed forces can't just, don't do it. They are not into political negotiations. They don't go and negotiate with people. They don't talk to people. They only know one way of controlling the population, and that is by terrorizing them. And nothing terrorizes a population as much as violence against women by the state, state violence against women. Because state violence against women is about, not only about controlling the woman or brutalizing the woman, but brutalizing the entire society. Because it has a wider repercussion on entire society. Because yes, men all, you know, should not be brutalized, men should not be, but the impact of the rights <coughs> is far, far greater. It has impacts on family, on children, intergenerational. It's huge. And so it, this is a qualitatively different kind of violence that we are talking about. Can you just, uh, I just forgot to mention that, uh, if you just go back to it, that uh, since 2009, <coughs> yeah, the government has declared, officially declared, uh, a war on Central India, the indigenous people of Central India, and it even has a name called Operation Green Hunt. Yeah. Now, they say now that that's not there, but we know that it still goes on, even though the official declaration has been, you know, withdrawn. And interestingly, the uh, Operation Green Hunt came at a time when Britain was bombing Libya because they were, you know, committing violence against their people because <coughs> Gaddafi was fighting, bombing his own people and everybody, you know, and Saddam was bombing his own people. But here is a government that has declared a war, has, a, has named it Operation Green Hunt, and yet we find nobody talking about it. And you can read Indian newspapers, you don't have to go very far and you'll find news about this every day in, in the newspapers. And after that, because there were, uh, uh, I, I call this privatization of terror. Yeah. Because <coughs> after 2009, when there was a backlash from the general public about, you know, the armed armed operations against the Indian uh, against the indigenous people <coughs> of Central India, uh, there the, what the government started doing is to train private militias. So they were armed by the army, they were trained by the army, 
they were supplied by the army, yeah, but these were officially not employed by the army. And this kind of private militia, and people took cases to the Supreme Court on this and said you can't have the government <coughs> arming one section of the citizens to fight another section of the citizens. The Supreme Court agreed and said no, you can't do that. But the government continues to do that anyway, and they have just renamed the organization. So if you want, you can go and file another case. And of course, they can be renamed as many times. And because in litigation, you know, it's the particular naming matters, because you always bring a case against a party, a named party. So you can have endless case reports. So just, just on that. Uh, if you look at this map, this is not really an up-to-date map because things have got worse since then. But these are almost, you will see, all the colored areas have some form of army deployment. So that you have almost a third of India under Special Powers Act, under anti-terrorism <coughs> laws. So if you look at the whole country and if you look at, so it's almost a third of the country. That's quite a lot if you consider India as a big, big, big country. Um, okay, I, having given this general background, I'll just go on to the movement in India against uh, uh, state violence against women. Uh, in, I don't know if uh, some of you may be aware that in 1975 we had emergency and Indira Gandhi declared emergency. She suspended the constitution and you know all civil liberties went out. And many of uh, many people were arrested, detained, whatever. And there was a nationwide movement. And in 1977, emergency was lifted, and there were elections. Indira Gandhi lost her uh, her uh, uh, position <coughs> as the prime minister. Now, immediately after that, there was a, a sentiment, if you like, and a wave of a feeling that the civil liberties movement should do something. Otherwise, you know, you never know. One day another prime minister could come and just, uh, you know, um, suspend the constitution again. And that is when we have what we call the <coughs> second phase of the civil liberties movement. And one of the first things that happened after the lifting of emergency was what the Mathura case. And what was Mathura? Mathura was a very poor Adivasi woman. And we are talking about a society which is very classist and very casteist. Yeah? So we are talking about a society where class and caste are central to everything else. And Mathura was a poor Adivasi woman, an indigenous woman. Adivasi is the name for indigenous people. So uh, she was in, and, and she lived in a very remote part of Maharashtra, the state that I come from. And she was a minor. And she went to the police station with her brother. She was to complain about some land dispute, whatever. <coughs> and when her brother, when the brother finished his complaint, whatever, the police told him to step aside and go outside. And while her brother was waiting outside, they raped her inside the, inside the police station. Yeah, three of them. Now, typically in India, Adivasi women, yeah, indigenous women, Dalit women, they get raped routinely. Nobody bothers. It is part of what life is if you are an indigenous person or a Dalit woman. But in this case, because of the environment created by the, night, the emergency and the lifting of the emergency, there was a huge protest against what happened. And a demand that, uh, because typically when cases, rape cases are tried by, you know, raped by police, because most of these things happen in police custody. And uh, when, when that happens, then um, they, because they are the ones who write the evidence, you see, they are the ones who do the investigation. So typically nobody is ever, uh, you know, tried and nobody is ever convicted. But in this case, there was a movement that custodial rape laws must be changed. And if a woman says, 
that she was raped in police custody, then the onus of proof, yeah, the burden of proof shifts on the man. And that was, I mean, you know, in terms of a fairly radical thing that time to happen. But since then, and, and although the law changes were happen, uh, happened, that didn't really change the reality on the ground. And these kind of uh, uh, cases continued to happen uh, and, and continued to, uh, you know, think. I just want to go through some of the most more prominent cases. <coughs> uh, these are kind of iconic figures and stuff. Yeah? This is Irom Sharmila. And Irom Sharmila is from Manipur, which is one of the states where the Armed Forces Special Powers Act operates. And one, when the brutality of the army against women became so unbearable, she went on a hunger strike. And she said she is not going to uh, you know, give up her hunger strike until the army deployment is withdrawn from her state. And it's 15 years now. She is still on hunger strike. She is force fed by uh, uh, glucose. And how does that happen? Because in India, uh, attempt to suicide is an offense. So when you go on a hunger strike, fast unto death, it becomes an attempt to suicide. And typically the police arrest you and they force feed you with saline. And so you don't die, but obviously you can't live on saline. Right? So, and every month they take her to the police station because she's on bail. They take her to the court. She has her uh, register, uh, attendance and she comes out. And the, police, the army is still there. The army do what they do. And she's still under arrest for her demand being that the Armed Forces Special Powers Act should be repealed and the army should be withdrawn from the state. So, but the thing about Irom Sharmila's case is she is, it's a completely nonviolent uh, pro means of protest, you know. I mean, you can't complain about terrorism, violence, somebody did something, nothing at all. I mean, she says, you know, I'm not going to give up this past unto death, which is, by the way, you know, very conventional uh, tradition. <coughs> Gandhi did it. Everybody, you know, in India, it's not an unusual thing to go on past unto death. But the way the police have found a way out of that by, you know, arresting people who go on past unto death and then keeping. And she's like an iconic figure now. Because for 15 years, the campaign has gone on. And obviously, the demand that she's asking is not an easy one. And no state is going to just withdraw the Armed Forces Special Powers Act when the state is occupied, effectively, by the federal government. Can you go to the next one? Now, this is the Manorama Mothers. This is, again, one of the very famous cases. Now, in this case, what happened? Why Manorama mothers? Yeah? Or mothers of Manorama? Manorama was a young woman and <coughs> she was abducted by the army and she was brutalized by the army, absolutely. And her body was thrown in the center of the town in, in, in Assam. And when the women came out in the morning and saw this body on the street like this in the city square, I mean, obviously they were furious, not least because this was not the only case. There were many other cases of women being tortured, but there is always like a last straw and the women snapped. And this is a, India is a conservative society. We don't strip very easily. But these women, I mean, they stripped completely without a stitch of clothing on them, they went to the Assam Armed Rifles office and with a big banner, army come and rape us. So you can imagine how, how extraordinary, how furious they must have been to do something like this. 
spontaneously. So you can't say, you know, there is some <coughs> guerrilla organization organizing them and there is some terrorist organization or there is some, you know, ideological group trying to organize them and get brainwash them or whatever. This was a spontaneous action. Women came out in the morning, they saw this brutalized body and they said, well, this is it. You know, we are not taking this anymore. Um, yeah. This is much more recent, 2011. In fact, we had a few meetings on Sony Sori here in London. Again, she knew she would be tortured. She approached the Supreme Court. She said, this is what they are going to do to me. Please grant me bail from arrest. And I will appear, whatever, but I don't want to be in custody because I know what they will do to me. And in spite of <laughs> forewarning the system, if you like, and the courts have a way of dealing with these things. They say, oh, you know, you are assuming too many things and let us just go and see and nothing, nothing will happen, etc., etc. If something happens, we are here, that kind of thing. And she was brutalized. Brutalized in a way that I can't, I can't, you know, repeat. Stones being shoved under her, into her. Anyway, that it's not, it's not the uh, thing. So, and with this kind of uh, 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 thing, <coughs> and this man, Anik Gar. He actually got a national award and he was her torturer. So not only you torture her, but then award the person who tortured her. And he got the gallantry award and he was the one responsible for the... Can we? Okay. Uh, this is another ongoing case of uh, Balala Padma. Now, what was, uh, she's currently in Jagdalpur jail, but as an under trial, trial prisoner. And she has been an under trial prisoner for eight years. And what was her thing? She was in the student movement. When she joined university, she became active in the students' union, which is not a forbidden thing for anyone to do. Indeed, some of us hope that students will join and be more active in the students' union. Yeah. And because of her uh, thing, she was uh, arrested in something. And then they keep charging her with new cases. So she gets acquitted, then she gets charged with another case. And then she gets acquitted, and then she gets charged with another case. And this has gone on for eight years. You just go from one case to another, to another, to another. And in every case, she has been acquitted because none of these cases are true. But the moment before she can come out, there's another charge and another case. And what is her offense? She's a political activist and she's in the women's movement in Andhra Pradesh. And she works for Chaitanya Maha, uh, Manila Samadhya. That is uh, what shall be, how does it translate? Conscious, <coughs> aware, women, aware of, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying, I'm translating it. But uh, so, but these are just some iconic cases which has become, but uh, you know, a national uh, rallying point, if you like. But at a more, you know, wider level, uh, I talked to you about the Mathura case in 1977 and how that triggered a nationwide, you know, protest leading to a re-examination of rape laws. In 2005, the women, women's movement felt that, you know, that the, it was focusing too much on family violence and patriarchy, but in fact, the real problem for many women was state violence. So in 2005, they launched a movement called, uh, and, and called the Coalition of uh, Women Against Violence, and they and one of the demands of that movement was state violence against women must be recognized as a form of violence against women. Now you would think this is obvious thing, you know, because state violence against anyone is a crime and state violence against women is a crime. Yeah. 
But the fact that this was a national demand, and it's useful to see India as 29 countries because you know it's it's sort of very diverse. It has many states. It has many local police, wherever where various um, military re regiments and operations. Some are federal uh, regiments. Some are you know what we call paratroopers. And this demand that state violence against women must be recognized as a form of violence against women came about because of the sheer number of women who were being arrested. Why 2005? Because you remember in two th that by that stage, the um, liberalization and neoliberal reforms were all underway in India. And the government had signed up like some 462 um, MOUs, yeah, memorandum of understanding with all kinds of corporations in the world. You may remember Modi came here in November and got a red carpet welcome. And he brought with him nine billion worth of business for Britain. So, you know, and, and because of that, now the government can come and sign these deals. But at the end of the day, they have to go back and deliver the land to those corporations. And then, then they have to deal with the people there. Right? Because, okay, it's nice to come to London and sign this thing and have a photo op with Cameron or whoever else at that time you know, was there. But then going back and telling the people, you have to leave your ancestral home. You have to leave your land. You have to leave because we have signed some agreement with somebody doesn't work. And so there was a spate of arrests and Operation Green Hunt in 2009 was a consequence of that. But before that, <coughs> large numbers of women, because women will defend their homes to the end, because that is where their life is, that is where they raise their children. And so women were at the forefront of these or of these struggles, and women were arrested in their hundreds of thousands, and that raised the question of coming back to where I started with political prisoners. Are they political prisoners? Because in the colonial times, political prisoners were prisoners who were involved in politics who were involved in members of a political party. And this uh, movement demanded the, the, uh, that that is not the case anymore in a so-called democratic society. Because in a democratic society, a trade unionist being arrested for trade union activity, a students' union activist being arrested for students' union work, a, a you know, slum clearance uh, activist opposing slum clearance, all these are political activists because all these our constitution says yeah, that we can do. We can we can protest against uh, you know slum clearance. We can protest against um, you know whatever and, and all. And so that moment actually saw the expansion of the definition of political prisoners as something far beyond just you know political thing. And. This goes on, and we now have, uh, again, the, there's an organization called Women Against State and Sexual Violence, uh, which is, you can look it up, WSS, and they regularly take up cases and regularly, uh, you know, deal with some of these things. But I want to just stop with one observation, and that is, you know, why is women political prisoners so important? As a civil liberties person, I'm against all state violence. I am against all, st you know, um, state illegalities of whatever kind. I think the, the importance of women political prisoners is <coughs> for much too long, we have neglected the political agency for much too long, we have put women 
in this category of patriarchy, equality, gender discrimination, <coughs> and, and all the cultural issues, but left them out of consideration as political actors, as political agents. Women have agency. Women have political agency. And we need to really recognize that and celebrate that. And women's political agency, we find, is active. You heard about Iran you, in India, in many African countries, in many other, you know. This is where you find real women's uh, political agency. And very often, the lens through which we see these things, you know, you think of India and you think of, you know, feudalism, patriarchy, whatever, you think of all that. But actually, if you look at it on the ground, the women are at the forefront of struggles. If you look at Sri Lanka, if you look at the Tamil women, if you look at the Indian women, if you look at the Iranian women, if you look at Nepali women, if you look at Filipino women, it's the women who are at the forefront of this. And we don't recognize this because in our minds, we have this idea that you know, women are oppressed by patriarchy, but as far as the state goes, that doesn't, you know, somehow doesn't feature. And that is why I think it's crucial that we recognize the political agency of women. So I'll just stop there. So we have until 8.30 to do the area, so if we can take any questions uh, from the audience, we're just going to move it here. I mean, do you all condemn the brutalities of Iranian government? And uh, everybody who cares about civil liberties and if they would be on your side, they just backed that they are looking to come down. However, you will know that there is a particular sect of Islam, Islam Iran represents. But in your initial talk, you generalize it as Islam as a whole. I mean, that's what I get. It. So, wouldn't it be better for you to specify a one particular Islam or the meaning of one particular Islam which are taken over by Iranian government? Because my understanding is that's not the Islam, but Iranian government is doing. And by generalizing it, it means that we are saying that every single Islamic country does the same thing, or if we, even if they don't do that same thing, they believe in that something. So, what would you appreciate in your view? With that respect. More questions for this round? Paul. Um, just, um, I, I uh, two, of the, two of the biggest um, political movements I've been involved in, uh, in terms of exposing my age more than uh, anything else, was um, the minor strike. In the mid 1980s, which kind of uh, really got me involved in, in kind of socialist politics and solidarity work. Uh, and the other big movement was uh, the poll tax movement. It's almost like a forgotten movement of the 1990s, where 13 million people decided not to pay the poll tax, and as a result of that movement, actually brought down Thatcher, despite all the you know, the, the, the official versions that it was some kind of Eurosceptic rebellion. Um, and, the, and kind of the lessons from those which can be drawn in terms of how 
the movements were able to sustain themselves the minor strike and the poll tax was the role that women played. Without the role of working, predominantly working class women, yeah, providing the active support and also on the picket lines and organising the anti politics unions and all the rest of it, <coughs> no doubt that those political movements would not have succeeded. I was particularly interested in the last comments, and it comes to the, the way that women are perceived in a movement. And I wonder whether, and I'd, I'd be interested in your view on this, I've always had an issue with identity politics. In, 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 I, I think they play a, a, a role in kind of raising the issues <coughs> of, of particular sections of society, but sometimes they, they, they're sometimes projected above and beyond the generalised movements and actually identity politics have kind of, you know, that's why I was interested in your last comments, of, of put people in boxes and we, we forget to acknowledge the generalised role that, you know, women can play, that uh, maybe, uh, you know, the black movement can play, that the, you know, other movements, that the, the, you know, the gay, uh, gay and lesbian movement can say, as poli political actors, not just for themselves, but political actors that are part of the generalised struggle to transform society. And when I say transform society, for me, it's a socialist transformation of society. And I think the comments that you made at the end were absolutely spot on. And I wonder what you think about how identity politics, sometimes I think, have been used by middle, by middle class people to promote <coughs> actually themselves above the generalised movements as a whole. That's kind of my question. <laughs> See it. Any question? So strength in prison is Islamic extremism versus Islam in general and identity politics. Yes. Um, how do we want to, do you want to start? I think the first two questions were all directed towards you and you asked them to our audience. Okay. Well, yes, I think it's always really uh, good to hear personal experiences because it gives you an insight. And I think uh, in some way, psychologically, it doesn't matter if you're the one really here. Even though I've been in prison and here for demonstration, of course, it's a bit similar. But of course, in some way, it's different. When I was I was arrested when I was 16 years old, and I was I mean when the, when the revolution started, I was 10 years old. I'm also saying my age, and uh, <laughs> so uh, obviously being inspired by all those women that you saw, I'm sure you got inspired when you saw those pictures only, and being all those women around you working fighting for humanity, a new York, of course, injustice, people get executed. I remember in our city, uh, when they came on the power, uh, in 20, in 10 minutes, they executed 22 people. And those were people that I knew. And as a child, of course, you get affected. And as I went along, of course, I was, I was a political activist, even though I was young, because it couldn't be anything but that. I was, moved, I was in student movement. I was a member of one of the leftist parties. Let's say, uh, just distributing flyers, these are our crime. So when I was arrested uh, at the age of 16, <coughs> when you say, what, how did you cope? What gives you motivation? I already, because we were prepared, actually, especially in, when you're a member of a political party, you read all the stories, and you get inspired. And I think you look at prison as part of your fight. So I went already with that feeling there and I think in the prison people forget I mean I'm talking about the torture but you forget that these are activists same activists in prison we often forget these are powerful people psychologically that they still sending letters and all that so in there of course I got the first I mean I'm not going to go on about it because it's a long basically story but I mean uh, I was in prison for three and a half years seven or eight months of that I was in solitary confinement and uh, it was somewhere that it was just a little room not like here having toilet or nothing like that and I think uh, I'm being I mean and the second night when they arrested me they basically one of the torture they did they had a metal bed and they put me upside down and sleeping on my basically lying down on my bed, they put lots of blanket on me, so I don't move, blindfolded, I mean, put something around my mouth, and they start lashing me under my, the sole of my feet, which I think is after two 
20 something years, I still remember it because they know what to do, how to torture you. And lots of other sexual harassment and all this during interrogation. And I think it's interesting, they didn't break me and they didn't break so many of people, other people like me. We had, my, I was 16, but we had people who were 12 years old, 13 years old. First of all, there is a, uh, that fighting spirit, as much as they torture you, somehow you get more angry. You're feeling like, I have to, I'm not going to let you break my spirit, no matter what you do to my body. So in a sense, I think, and also bear in mind, we had some people with human beings, at the end of the day, yes, we get broken, and it's okay. You know, there are some people that they couldn't tolerate. They told, you know, who are they, I mean, have activity with and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, what I think what helped me is this fighting against injustice that they killed so many people. They killed the, my best friends, basically. One of my friends died right in front of my eyes and I couldn't do anything at the age of 17. And uh, those images was in my mind and I couldn't actually, to me, even now I'm thinking about it, it makes me angry. It doesn't make me scared, two different things. And at the same time, inside the prison, we were quite good supporting each other. Even if we were, you know, more thing, <laughs> we got really good at it, talking to each other through the walls. So just giving, you know, you can imagine those people's story of, you know, do you remember one time I went to the park, I had this beautiful ice cream. It's crazy, you're in a cell, you're under torture, but that actually keeps you alive. And I think when you did, you know what to do know how to keep yourself alive and basically when you when I went to the prison I didn't know I'm gonna come out in fact I should say I was lucky that I wasn't executed because I got released right three months before the massacre of 1988 and they wanted me to send them my family managed to give them some money and I got released after two months after my sentence basically so when you go there it's part of your fighting it is and I guess when I came out, guess what? They thought they broke me and everything. They wanted me to not to participate in any organization, nothing like that. Of course, I say I won't. So that actually kept me going more. And I think one of the reasons maybe I didn't talk about myself is whenever I have a speech somewhere, I think I feel like I'm the voice of those friends that couldn't be here. Maybe they could have been here and speak to you, but they can't. No one knows what happened. Even I don't know. But at least I think that gives me that drive to go on and talk about it. And I think that's what, I mean, someone, a journalist asked me once, he said that sometimes people are really good, tortured, they rather be dead than be alive. Have you, have you ever had such a feeling? I can't remember. I always wanted to be alive. <laughs> I always wanted to be alive because, of course, and that's one thing that killing this perpetrator, that you want to be alive, you're actually still loving life, even in that under the worst possible situation. You can ask me any question, I don't know. <laughs> and how did I actually deal with it after the war? I went, of course, through years of therapy to be able to deal with this horrible thing, because of course, as someone who suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, as all survivors of torture do, of course, it affects all aspects life still does but of course through psychological work and therapy it helped me and I actually gave me motivation to be one therapist and help other people in a sense yeah as for your question very interesting question um, again I'll start with one personal story remember I was 10 years old when the Islamic regime came I didn't grow up my parents are Muslim by because they were born in Iran they believe in God they believe in Islam but they're not practicing anything. I didn't grow up in a family that are really fanatically Islamist or anything like that. And when I was 10 years old, only the Islamic regime came on the power. So I didn't know different Islams, as you say. I didn't read any book. But I remember when I was 12 years old, I went and read Quran, which I believe you agree it's, it's Quran. <laughs> you can't have three Qurans. I went and read it. I was really, uh, I mean, of course, because what happened to women, I, all, I mean, I've been always passionate about women's rights. And I went and just said, that, let me see. I remember I was just really, really young. They said, let me see what this Quran is saying that everyone talking about it. 
And I was going through it and just looking at it. I'm looking in Surah Nisa, of course you know about women. And all these, it's actually no one told me this is Islam, this is not. I read it myself and I felt that's brutal. Why should I be, as a woman, be treated differently according to that? If I don't listen to my husband, first you, you'll be told off, second you'll be slapped, and third, he's not going to sleep with you or kick you out. I'm saying it in my words, of course. I mean, uh, not exact word from God. But what I'm saying, when you say it, it's not generalization, it's fact. Any country that Islam is under power, is under power, the law of the country. I mean, this is what happened in Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Iran, or any country that has the influence of Islam. And there is a reason for that. Because if your book, the Quran, says that woman is not equal to men, and obviously it's your ideology, you do it, you put it there. When you say generalize it, well, I would like to ask you, which one is the good Islam? I'm not interpreting it differently because it doesn't need interpretation. It is what it is. It is what it says. That's why when I was reading these, quotes, these laws and policies from the book, these are all taken from there. So don't they say that, I'm not very good with exact quote, that woman is your field, go into it whenever you want to? This is from Quran. This is not from me. This is no different interpretation. I think this becomes so fashionable to talk about different interpretation because they want to make an excuse for Islam. Don't, I chose to be an atheist. I'm a socialist. And I, I'm an atheist because I don't believe in any God and any religion. Equally, I don't believe Christianity or Judaism is better than Islam. But now that is that, I think there is a trend that they try to say that uh, I mean, do you remember the call? I'm just going to read say it quickly. The Germany, the call of when they attacked women. All this news, you know about it, right? They attacked thousands of women. All this news, part of it was about Islam, blah, blah. But big part of it was quite angry. Why do you say Islam? Maybe it's not. Maybe this and that. They didn't care thousands of women got attacked. Come on. That's an issue. Not attacking Islam. What I'm saying, I mean, if your base is humanity, then you don't go from anywhere else. You don't go and define your humanity based on religion. You don't do that. You just, you're a human being and you care for human being. And if I see, as a 12 years old, and I'm telling you the truth, I see Quran saying that <coughs> woman is actually half of man, I say rubbish. I don't accept that. I don't respect even that law and religion and culture that tell me rubbish because I'm a female, because my gender is different. My question is how mature you were in the age of 12 years to make that judgment and to read within the context of that surah. I understand this brings up a lot of it. This may be a discussion for afterwards in terms of religion. Can I just say one sentence? Okay. Right. I was just a child. I was just reading as it was. But remember, children usually get it right. You know what? Because they're not brainwashed. They don't have a point of reference. I think so therefore, just one more sentence. What I'm trying to say... What I'm trying to say, but 40 years after that, I was proved I was right. I shouldn't believe in Islam, actually. It's against humanity and women. Thank you. Okay, I think we're, you're on to identity politics. It's a good discussion about being a woman, being a socialist, and um, whether or not you follow Islam. So, on to identity politics, maybe why if you want to. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll just pick up on that question and maybe comment on your question because I think it's quite an important one. You know, I mean, it's on everybody's minds. Um, as for uh, uh, your question about identity politics, I'll now take off my academic hat and wear my activist hat <laughs> and uh, yeah, to answer your question. Um, I agree totally that, you know, uh, the identity politics does, you know, is, is very problematic. Is very but I will also add something to it. As you go down the class hierarchy, class caste hierarchy, you know, identity politics has loses its place. So if you go down to the Adivasis there, if you go down to people struggling for land, if you go down to people who are, uh, you know, who are involved in trade unions, sweatshops, whatever, 
they there is no yes the women come out and they organize and they do their thing but there is no the politics is not about identity the politics is a universal one the politics is about land the politics is about eviction the politics is about displacement the politics is about that now as far as this demand for recognizing women political prisoners and recognizing state violence against women it's a demand against the state it is not categorizing women as something you know an exclusive political category or whatever it is about you know recognizing or getting the state to recognize that they need to acknowledge this is happening and have steps in place for you know women prisoners who are arrested for political reasons for whatever perhaps you know uh, army you know whether whether the armed forces should be called into account whether you know uh, uh, there should be uh, the immunities of armed forces should be uh, removed so it gets into all those kind of issues against the state and any democratization of the state as this demand is yeah is a democratization of the whole society because you can't have a state which withdraws the armed forces yeah for only for women maybe they have some provisions for women there but that then has got an impact and influence and consequences for everyone but it has been my experience at least that as you go down the class and caste hierarchy those boundaries between identity politics and politics generally the general politics as you said becomes quite you know made and i'm sure I, i i imagine it must be the same with the women on the picket lines here or against poll tax or whatever i was not here then so i can't <laughs> say anything about that but so you know uh, and, and and identity politics is a very middle class thing because it it identifies women as something outside of society or as something you know outside of of all the other people in society whereas our struggles are always for whole of society not just for women so that is uh, that is one thing but i just want to come to your question about you know islam and i think it's uh, i come from a country which is home to the second largest muslim population in the world even now after partition and there are <coughs> our people uh i think that there is a shift that has come in the way we see these things islam has been there in south asia ever since islam came into existence it has been there in southeast asia ever since you know the merchants took islam to all those places 1000 years now and the adaptation of religion to culture occurred everywhere so even now if you go to malaysia for example if you go to uh, indonesia if you come to you know south india um, the islam there is very different in the way people practice it and the way and people are quite chilled out about the way you know they they act about this this problem we used to, in india we used to call call it the arabization of islam i don't call it the arabization of islam because many of my arab friends say that that is not their version of islam so i've stopped here, after coming here i don't say that use that term because i understand that there is a problem with that but with the 1970s onwards there was the two things happened one is uh, the middle eastern countries the south the, the oil countries they adopted an official policy that they will give jobs only to muslim workers and we are not short of poor muslim workers not in india not in indonesia we have as many of them as you care to have and they are there so for many of them that was the only employment opportunity and that came with ties that our version of islam is a right one how we practice it is a right one how you guys do it for example i am tamil and tamil muslims have never ever I, i mean you know 
I've never seen Tamil Muslims until very recently wearing uh, a hijab. I mean, they wore the sari and they had the, covered their heads, but, but that was it. But now the whole culture is changing. So that is, that is one part of it. Of course, if you ask the Saudi governments, they will say, you know, that this is our uh, uh, policy and we only give jobs to Muslims because we are a Muslim country. And our governments will say, we are a poor country, so if people <coughs> can find a livelihood somewhere else, that's up to them to find. The other thing is, what has happened throughout this region, and I'm focusing on South Asia and Southeast Asia, particularly, because I don't know about the other places. But these are huge. I mean, Indonesia is the largest Muslim population, and India is the second largest. So, you know, you have. From, again, the 70s, alongside that, we had a lot of Saudi money coming in to support the mosques. And a lot of the imams were then being trained. They used to be trained here. In fact, in Kashmir, which is again a Muslim state, right? uh, one of the demands of the people was, we want our own imams back. We don't want these people coming from somewhere else and, and being our imam because this person doesn't even speak our language. You know, what, what kind of imam is he if he can't speak our language? And they come in and they bring new practices. And they bring in, you know, what is the correct version of Islam. And that upsets people in many ways. For one thing, they've been, they say, you know, we've been Muslims for all these years. And now, uh, you know, why is it suddenly what we have been doing all these years become bad? Uh, and, and, yeah, I mean, you know, so there are some of those issues as well. And I don't think we can find answers to these questions by just looking at the book. Because the book has been read for a thousand years now. And, and people have read it and interpreted it in so many different ways. That is why we have so many schools of thought. Yeah. So I think it's also important to bring it back to the ground and bring it back to, you know, society. I think that's very, that is very learned something very much for that. That's more grassroots. <laughs> uh, I think it's, I think series of lectures on this topic alone in terms of Islam and women. I think we have wandered slightly off. Can I just one sentence? Well, it's just that we have to be out of here in about five minutes. If one sentence, yes. yes. I think this is a conversation for the past. I'm so sorry. I don't. We don't have enough time. We're getting kicked out at 8.30, so I'm very sorry. It just... Uh, this is a topic that everyone's very passionate about, so it's 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 difficult to keep down such short. Sense. One is that that one we're talking about political Islam, Islam in power. Second, Christianity doesn't kill women anymore as a witches. Does that make it better? Is it acceptable? We can't do that. We have to go from the source. If the law says this is against women, this is what happened. You man, I mean, they define different right based on thing. We have to go back. I'm sorry, we can't use different interpretations. That's fine. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure this is something which we can all. Yeah, uh, I'd like to. No, I just said it. I'm from America where evangelical <laughs> Christians are doing things which very much could could kill women in terms of not giving them the right to determining their pregnancies, even the church. The church is not like a power. So that's why I think, um, in terms of the identity, I know. Paul's gone, but I think that's one of the reasons why, particularly the Haldane feminist lawyers, focus on intersectional feminism as opposed to what's traditionally seen as white liberal feminism, which really looks at generally white middle class women and their sort of struggles, but, but trying to see it within the context of the whole, to listen um, to, to, to women, to women of colour, people of colour, uh, people who are marginalised in society, and, and seeing their experience of the struggle and bringing it towards one greater struggle. And I think that's one of the things that, that Haldane society is about, though, of course, we have. Um, differing opinions within the group, but I think that's what the Housing Feminist Lawyers is about. First of all, um, I'd like everyone to, to thank our speakers for coming. <laughs> Thank you.